Welcome back to this second plenary decision, not decision, but uh, plenary session. We have now shifted focus from anti-doping to match fixing. And read my lips, I'm not Andreas Silias. My name is Jens Sivel, and I'm the law professor here from Aarhus University, and I'm the uh, former chairman of Anti-Doping Denmark. I'm uh, chairing the sports law, uh, the Nordic Sports Law Conference tomorrow, and I hope to see many of you there. I'm not going to talk about myself, even though it's very tempting. I'll give the word to the first speaker, namely Chris Easton, who's going to speak about how betting initiated and funds match fixing. You now live in Doha, and I you do, yeah. are the head of uh, International Center for Sports Security, director of, sorry. Yeah. The word is yours. I think I'll take the coffee as we're all relaxed in the evening. You know, I don't want to, uh, to in any way limit the absolute importance of what we heard today about, uh, about doping, but uh, I've had my own performance enhancing drugs before I came here tonight. A few, a few beers between the time of finishing and uh, has put me in fine form, I hope. You know, uh, betting fraud and how it initiates and funds match fixing. And, uh, it's, it's extremely important, in my view, that we need to shift this debate. The debate on, uh, on match fixing has almost exclusively centred on the sport itself and exclusively centred on the performers in the field, the players, as it were. I've taken, I've got some notes and I'll go back to those notes shortly, but I just want offhand to tell you that I think that players are in fact the least important in match fixing. They might be the, the ones who execute the plan in the field, but there's an awful lot of people involved before it gets to the, to the field corruption and the match fix. My background in, uh, in match fixing in fact commenced in investigating match fixing, I should point out, not in match fixing itself was when I commenced uh, my task at FIFA in 2010. I was formerly uh, for over a decade with Interpol and uh, I was invited, quite flatteringly, to accept a post with FIFA by FIFA before the World Cup in 2010. And uh, in 2010 I had no comprehension as a reasonably long-standing international police investigator of match fixing. It had no level of importance to me at all. It wasn't until I came to FIFA that I realised after the World Cup, and perhaps to some extent during the World Cup in South Africa, the significance of match fixing in football. And it was after the World Cup that I then commenced a personal investigation, if you like, to determine what really is the significance of this in all sports. And uh, of course there were a lot more people who preceded me. There was a lot of investigations, including you know, journalists and, uh, and literary articles on match fixing but the hard reality had to be confirmed to me and it was very quickly confirmed. Match fixing presents I think the most serious threat to sport as we know it today. Uh, it is not, although I don't underestimate the significance of doping, but doping as we know the cliche is cheating to win and match fixing is corrupting to lose. And corrupting to lose in a way that necessarily involves many external agents from sport itself and making sport the servant essentially of the uh, of the corruptors it's a a very traditional form of corruption universally in life the form of corruption that applies to football and to sport generally is replicated in general form in the corruption of politics the corruption of business the corruption of, uh, of economic movements and um, big economies such as the uh, derivatives trades and, uh, and uh, share markets, currency corruption. Because necessarily, necessarily, for modern match fixing, and I don't dismiss the issues of spontaneous match fixing, match fixing that involves players uh, making a spontaneous a decision to fix a match for their own personal benefit, still happens sometimes perhaps administrators, perhaps even referees making spontaneous decisions to fix outcomes for their own personal benefit. Certainly for the purpose of relegation avoidance or team friends doing things, these are still traditional and continuing reasons to fix sporting outcomes. 
or manipulate the outcomes of sporting contests. But they dwarf in the importance of betting fraud initiated match fixing. The motivation today for match fixing is driven by the economic realities of betting fraud. That's hence my subject heading today here. That betting fraud initiates and funds modern match fixing. Not all match fixing, but what I call loosely modern match fixing. It is a particular form of greed. And it is organised crime doing what organised crime knows how to do, which is to take advantage of loose and under-regulated environments, be it narcotic uh, trafficking, be it uh, slave trade, be it firearms trafficking. They're applying the same techniques to sport that they've applied to other activities in life, human activities in life. There are two particularly important aspects of, uh, of, of humanity at play here. People like to play sport. People like to play, which translates into sport. People are, people are inherently attracted. There are some exceptions, but for the most part, people are inherently attracted to the competition of sport and playing an organised sport too. But despite the fact that many nations prohibit and outlaw gambling on sport, the fact is that people love to gamble on sport. People love to gamble generally. Gambling, not necessarily for money, but challenging your, your friend or your colleagues or, uh, or even people you don't know about the outcome of two flies crawling up a wall, which fly will get to the top of the ceiling first. This is a very, very common human trait. This is a collision between these two traits, a collision between the trait, the human need and desire and enjoyment in sport, together with the human need and enjoyment to, to gamble. I say not necessarily for money. But tonight, I'll only talk about the corruption in the field of play, and, and uh, particularly in contests and matches. I won't talk about uh, the uh, uh, corruption of sport administrations. You know, the, the uh, corruption of sport administrations uh, is, an, is another matter, really. Sport bodies are registered somewhere in the world, so there's usually a jurisdiction of some kind. And the question of willingness to take action, of course, is another matter. You know, there are many jurisdictions to cover the issue of corruption of sport administration that are reluctant to take action against uh, sport organisations. But that's a separate question to the existence of, of jurisdiction and legislation. But this conference, as I heard today, is an important component of addressing that issue of sport governance. But I'm not going to address governance here. Match fixing is not necessarily about governance. The corruption of sport contests and the corruption of sport uh, uh, competitive matches is vastly more international, in my opinion, in the planning and execution, and therefore vastly more complex to prevent, to investigate, and to prosecute. Moreover, today, most corruption of competitions and matches routinely involves international criminality and betting fraud, most of them. Marco Sesnik today outlined a sadly typical corrupting scenario, what we call attract, compromise, intimidate in this sequence. Criminals are very good when they corrupt people in organisations or activities like sport at attracting people to, uh, to their cause, to their, to their way of doing things. Compromising them, sometimes with, uh, with uh, catching them doing things they're not legally entitled to do, like take money, or to uh, honey pots, all sorts of reasons or ways that criminals use to attract and compromise people. But ultimately, inevitably, intimidation is involved. And Mark had described that today. This is a typical transnational organised crime tactic anywhere. And it's this volatile mix of criminals, multiple crimes and multiple jurisdictions that the self-protective capability of the sport bodies is seriously challenged. The planning of the primary crime, associated crimes and other criminal acts are commonly committed in many different countries. The, included, uh, the involved criminals themselves typically also have various nationalities and the many organisations that are either complicit or cheated come from many parts of the world. Inevitably then, international match fixing and associated betting fraud, it's associated betting fraud, are incredibly complex 
crimes to investigate across multiple jurisdictions and with numerous, often unclear, responsible authorities. Yes, as I said, there are other forms of match-fixing, but when betting, betting fraud is the motivation, criminals and guns become part of the mix. Match-fixing has an historical basis, certainly, but modern ma match-fixing, as I said before, is an eclectic mix of motivations that are, for the most part, funded by betting fraud. In short, betting fraud initiates and funds modern match-fixing, not the reverse. It's a chicken-and-egg argument to some extent, but I'm saying the reason that we have match-fixing, modern match-fixing, for the most part, is driven by betting fraud. There are three big and global economies in this mix, and they're all economies of their own right. Firstly, sport itself. The administration of sport is itself a massive global economy. We've heard that today, and you'll hear more of it in the next two days, the amount of money surrounding and involved in the conduct of sport. Secondly, sport, b sport betting is itself a massive economy. And lastly, transnational organised crime is itself a definable and measurable economy. But none of these three economies are truly globally regulated or oversight. I say globally regulated or oversighted. Your sport has this cherished notion of independence, political independence. And I'm not going to talk much about that except to say that James Dorsey will address this tomorrow or, or Thursday. And listen to him carefully. Secondly, sport betting, which is this second economy, is a business that thrives off cutting-edge communications technology and algorithms. Traditional regulation just cannot keep up with the innovation of gaming or sport betting. Massive amounts of money, enormously complex and well-educated people who are behind the algorithms and the sport betting machinery that turns over billions of dollars weekly, billions of dollars weekly. And transnational crime, the third measurable economy, takes advantage of our nation-centred crime response. International policing is shackled in 19th century regulation, legislation and cooperation practices. Thus, these three independent but now coexisting economies, sport, sport betting, transnational organised crime, that are under-regulated and purely market-driven, are unintentionally creating a perfect storm of damage for sport. It is uh, quite, I suppose, coincidental that we have a storm here tonight. This underlines my point. There is a perfect storm surrounding sport today, driven by uh, betting fraud particularly, and organised crime especially. Governments at a world level are mostly spectators in this, but someone, some organisation, some government has to step up before world sport, as we understand it today, suffers a fatal collapse. We heard today about cycling. It is horrifying to see the drop in interest in the uh, Tour de France. Horrifying to see. It should be a harbinger for many other sports. It's also horrifying if there, is there are very few people here who come from Asia. I understand there's a colleague from South Korea. South Korea, I can assure you, has a massive problem, and had a massive problem, of betting fraud initiated match fixing. In all sports, even such obscure sports as motorboat racing, we had sumo wrestling in Japan, an ancient sport of respect, suffered from match fixing recently. Asia is, a, uh, is, a, is the centre also, coincidentally, perhaps not coincidentally, of uh, most sport betting organisations, the biggest sport betting organisations in the world. I'm going to give you six conclusions for your consideration, very quickly. There are three big global economies at play in match fixing, sport, sport betting and transnational organised crime. But none of these are truly globally regulated oversight. There, these three global economies, secondly, sport, sport betting and transnational organised crime, under-regulated and purely market-driven, are creating a perfect storm of damage to sport. Thirdly, while there are other forms of match-fixing, when it is for betting fraud, criminals, their methods and their guns are introduced directly into sport. Fourthly, sport must do better and be managed and governed better on match-fixing. 
People in sport are sport's problem. But governments must do even more. Criminals are their problem, not sport's problem. Fifthly, organised crime has adopted match fixing and betting fraud as an income stream. I pose the question, how long before this becomes an income stream for terrorism? They've copied much of organised crime. They've copied much of their techniques and money making. Why not would they not copy this? Lastly, to stop match fixing, governments must globally regulate sport betting and support a global platform to exchange information and to coordinate responses. Action is needed on this and needed quickly. Thank you very much. Thank you to Chris Eaton. Uh, we'll take the questions afterwards when we have the uh, panels settled here. So I'd like to welcome you, Chris. Maybe you should make your own introduction to the, to the topic. Thank you. To be here. My name is Chris Rasmussen. I'm uh, working for the World Lottery Association. Um, in the past three and a half years, I've been monitoring uh, odds movements and money flow from the lotteries around the world. Um, so that's my background. Before that, I, I did some fantasy games. So I've alwa always been in, in, in this kind of uh, sports, betting, fantasy, business. Um, a little bit of background from the lotteries. Um, there's different ownerships in the in different worlds of the uh, for the lotteries. We have uh, co-ownership, but and most of them are of course uh, owned by the government. And uh, I would say probably 40% of the lotteries have sports betting, so it's not the biggest uh, biggest economy for the lotteries. Uh, that's all the scratch and lotto and so on. Um, but the lot of lottery business is is quite big. To say that we, ha uh, we have appro approximately 275 billion in sales, only 10% is from sports betting. Um, and each year we give around 80 billion to good causes. That's, uh, that's uh, some kind of business. As Walter he will hear the, the next couple of days, s sports betting and, and lotto games is, is quite huge in, in, in the world. Um, this is just an estimation of, of the of the lottery business that is grown actually uh, each year, and it seems that it keeps going. It's the same for sports betting, which I'm going to talk about now. Um, when we are talking about the international betting market, we often say that it is in four cat categories. We have the lotteries, which is my job to to monitor their their odds movements and and report the, the, their opinion. We have the European private bookmakers. We have the Asian bookmakers, and then we have the illegal betting market. Um, under the European private bookmakers, we also have the betting exchanges. So let's have, have a look at of the international betting mar market, which seems quite big. Um, I've just listed the, the fif 15 biggest companies up. Um, and if you take all the, the business in, in estimation, it's uh, approximately 2.5 trillion euros, which is uh, 25 times 25 times bigger than, than business conducted in the UK. So we see some figures here. I'm sorry about the China sports lottery. That should, of course, be, <laughs> be green. Oh, well, sorry, blue as a, a lottery business. Um, Then I'm trying to, to talk about the illegal betting market, and that's uh, pretty much impossible to have some estimation for that. Some people are talking about 365 billion uh, euros per year, and other people are saying a trillion. It's, uh, when we go out, we hear different figures, and, and because it's illegal, no one can actually estimate correct, I would say. We can have an idea, and we have an idea. But if we look at the first figure, that's uh, 50 times more than the annual prof profit of Toyota. Toyota is the biggest uh, car company in the world. Sorry for for few who is from the States, but it is. And if we look at the s s second figure, then it's uh, twice the turnover of Coca-Cola. I think we all know Coca-Cola and we can always 
everywhere we are in the world, we can buy a, a Coke. So it's kind of uh, huge, but as I said, it's impossible to make estimation of, of this because it's going on in illegal sites on, on online and by runners uh, around the world, street sales and so on. So it's it's very difficult to is estimate, uh, estimate. So what are we actually doing in the lottery world? Well, we have partnership with IPES. Uh, I think the most of you know IPES, the uh, uh, International Press Association. We made an education program with Swatercourt, which is adopted by uh, Interpol. We are monitoring odds and the betting movement, not only our own uh, odds movement, but also the the Asian market and, and the European market and so on. And then of course we have the partnerships on the global level with IOC, FIFA and UEFA. Um, it's important to say that each lottery around the world have of course uh, agreement with their own sports in their own countries. So on local level we, we have, uh, we will report betting, uh, a suspicious betting pattern to our local uh, partners. So because we, we are the lotteries, we only take money from people in our own countries. So we, are not, we cannot share information about players because we have only players from our own countries, betting, punters. Um, and even that we are called the European Lotteries Monitoring System, we are actually the global monitoring, a lotteries monitoring system. We have, our, of course, partnerships with our friends from Asia and, and from Mexico and so on, where we have, have lotteries. So what is that we actually are doing? Of course, we know our own markets. We are a kind of specialists from, from each region. Um, each member understands his business. That will say if he, kno he knows pretty much how, money, how much money that will be placed on, on a match and how they will be divided into 1x2. Um, we also know that we have to limit some bets and we do that. Besides that, we are of course monitoring our, our competitors. Um, <coughs> this is just uh, the some of the biggest one in, in the markets. Uh, the Asian bookmakers, uh, we have a system where we can see pretty much all the bookmakers, how the odds are changing. So when we see some suspicious uh, odds movements in or even in our own business, we are, we are saying to people, <coughs> sorry, we are closed. We cannot bet on this match anymore. Or we are, we will not close a match or trying not to close, but we will put down the limit so you can bet a few amounts of, of euros or dollars or Danish crowns. But we do close when we see very suspicious betting pattern. It happens between five to 10 times per year that we say to our members, now you have to shut down this match. And then you can probably, then we'll probably ask, you know, why you said five to 10 times per year, we hear for 300 examples for e from each year. And that's also correct. There is probably 300 examples for, for match fixing each year or maybe more. But because we, are, we have only 10,000 to 30,000 events in the lottery business, and the European bookmakers have up to 60,000 events per year, and the Asian bookmakers have a lot more, then the lottery business are often the top leagues, you can say. We are not going down to the Southwest National Australian League, where the players are maybe not getting paid or they're just playing for fun. And we all know that if they're not getting salary, we heard that a few hours ago, then you're probably more in, uh, into get some money out of your, your sports. So here we have a good example of, uh, of a possible manipulation. Um, it might get a little bit, little bit nerdy, but uh, we have an in-play match. It, this, this was in play betting and, and because you can bet, the limit is raised when the match is going on, so you can bet a lot of money in, in on the Asian market, so that's why the match fixes have, have gone, gone into the 
to do in-play betting because, uh, instead of uh, pre-live betting. But as you can see, the I've made a calculated odds. We have, uh, as Chris, Chris has mentioned just before, we have uh, algorithms who, is, who are deciding how the odds should move in a certain way. And we can see this for this match, let's take place uh, one year ago approximately, uh, we, we reported this match because of the, the odds movement, of course. You can see that the, the calculated odds in the 88 minute, and then how the odds actually was. It's, uh, it's mean that I've been placed a lot of money. And then uh, in 91 minutes, there was a goal, and if you look at the, at the match, then I would say, together with my former football player uh, from Croatia, that maybe the player was not giving 100%. It was a little less, I, will, I would say. Um, so that's actually how we are helping. Uh, we're not ever going out to say in, uh, at that a match is fixed. That's not our goal. Or We're saying that how we see business, and, and we're saying how things are from our side. We can close the matches, we can limit our customers or limit bed types so we don't see that kind of money in our business. We don't want that kind of money in our business. But I would also say if you offer sports betting and you do it in a legal and in a responsible way, there's absolutely nothing wrong with neither the, the in-play betting or the pre-life betting. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. And now we have Will van Meggen, Director of Fipro, to take the word. Well, thank you for inviting me. Uh, for those of you who don't know um, what Fipro is, we are the voice of uh, about uh, 50 to 60,000 football players around the globe. And we have uh, 58 uh, member countries since uh, since last week, and um, well, we did some uh, investigation looking at uh, match fixing. We um, have uh, uh, made an investigation which is called the FIFRO Black Book for Eastern Europe. Uh, it still uh, can be downloaded on our website, and it's about uh, 200 to 250 pages. Well, when we look at football and organized crime, you must say, well, it's a strange combination because football is about sport and not about uh, organized crime. But as we already heard, the reality is different. So um, I will go into some uh, of the details of the Black Book. Um, I will talk about the impact of crime in football, why we did a Black Book, what the outcome of our investigation was, and what we and when I say we, I mean the players, what the players can do to prevent match fixing. We look at the uh, immediate cause of the black book. We got, as FIFPRO, as the, the global organization, we got signals from, especially from Eastern Europe, that things were going wrong there, uh, looking at uh, the issue of match fixing. And we organized a conference in 2011 in Thessaloniki. And it's important for you to tell you that this conference was behind closed door, so no press allowed and no one externally allowed. And there we saw uh, not only uh, testimonies like those of Mario Sismek, but many more regarding match fixing, because behind closed door, uh, players were uh, prepared to talk about this, but outside of the room, nobody is talking. When we looked at the match fixing, there were in fact two uh, different kinds of uh, match fixing. There was the sporting kind, buying a championship, uh, not getting relegated, and the other one was the betting related match fixing. And what was very clear after the conference for us is that the problem was widely spread. And what was our answer to that? It was research because we need evidence based investigations. What did we do? We had an uh, investigation in 15 countries around uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, we uh, had to um, 
disregard the, uh, the figures from three of our countries because they were not uh, statistically uh, relevant enough to uh, include them. But we had a questionnaire for all professional players in those countries. It was anonymous and also it was possible for the players to make personal statements, and they did. And the result was for us uh, a surprisingly great response. We had more than 3,000 uh, questionnaires returned, and which meant for us that FIFPRO was a reliable partner when we look at the players. We had investigations in five areas. The first one is the contracts. Um, how is the relationship between the club and the player organized? The financing, the financing of the club, training alone, and with training alone, uh, you have to realize we're talking about football. Football is a team sport, and training alone is used as a sanction for players who do not comply with the wishes of the leadership of the clubs. We uh, had some questions about match fixing and also about violence, and violence uh, we included racism as well. We had a task force in place which collected all the information and scientists uh, from the uh, University of Ljubljana, they did the statistic work for us. And I give you some of the outcomes because the whole black book is uh, over 250 pages so it will be not possible to uh, give them all to you. But one of the things was that there was a lack of written contracts between the club and the player, which is quite strange in a situation where you talk about professional football. There was also a lack on written bonus systems. And also in some uh, even substantial numbers of cases, we saw that there were no labor agreements in place, which in fact means in combination with the lack of contracts that there was no legal protection for those players. However, the most important outcome was uh, the fact of non-payment. And we saw that an astonishing amount of 41.4% of the respondents said, well, we did not get paid in time. And uh, this was on average more than uh, six months. And here it says 5% uh, of the players had to wait more than six months, but uh, it is more than 12 months. There are several correlations between non-payment and match fixing. 55% of the players who were not paid reported to be approached for match fixing. Training alone, 31% of them were approached. And violence, victims of violence, 38.6% were approached. And in fact, it was li like Chris Eaton said, the criminals can smell vulnerable players. But we also look at the complexity of the problems. And the solution, there is not a single solution. We have to think about small steps. For instance, a code of conduct co tailor-made for football. We have to look at the practice of every day in order to get new steps in the fighting of match fixing. But the key issue is and stays the vulnerability of players. And then what we can do. We can look at training and education. This is a key for a good understanding, and it's the beginning of the solution. But it's, of course, not enough. We have a brick problem here, because, as Mario Sismek uh, earlier on stated, the m most players have no one to go to. There's lack of awareness, and there's lack of knowledge. You must realize that in many of the clubs, there is corruption, and even in the federations, there is corruption. And then we look at the role of FIFA and UEFA. Question is, are they crime fighters? No, of course not, they are not. And we say that fighting crime is subject for law enforcement. And I quote Mr. Mutske, who is now the, the officer in place at UEFA for uh, match fixing, the fighting of match fixing. But the question is, what can we do as non-NGOs? We can create a safer environment for the players. And we have as an example, we have the Netherlands, where we have in place a licensing system, uh, looking at the, the UEFA financial fair play system. There you see that uh, there are strict rules regarding 
payment of players, uh, written contracts, etc. We need guarantees that labor agreements are met and that sanctions are uh, in place in case there is non-payment. And what we see in this uh, field, there are no significant problems in the Netherlands. There are not yet, and I hope and I think there will not be reports of big match-fixing incidents, but it's really important to emphasize that enforcement within the Federation is key here. So in fact, we are looking at good governance. Clubs must pay in time. When we look at, for instance, the big scandal in Finland, the fact that the players had such a low salary, some of them came from Africa and they got, uh, in fact, salaries which we say, well, it's normal that they got involved in match fixing because the salary they received from their clubs was not enough to earn their living. But we can also look at another model. We saw in the Bundesliga in Germany that there's a kind of self-regulation. There are no cases of non-payment in Germany, and why is that? The clubs say we don't allow each other not to pay the players and every other employ employ uh, employees of the club. But also we have to look and to address the agents. Also there we need due diligence and transparency, like for instance in the UK, and we have to await what, will the, what the new FIFA rules will bring. But in fact, uh, my statement here is that agents are a part of the problem. Because we see in some countries where there are good regulations, we see no problems. In other countries, there are many problems. And we look, there um, we look at the FIFA DRC case law. We see that, uh, for instance, in Cyprus, it's one of the smallest countries in the European community. They have the most problems with the FIFA DRC, the Dispute Resolution Chamber. Players are not paid. They are dismissed. Then we see that the clubs abuse the procedures before FIFA and before CAS. But what we see is that although the players do not get paid, the agents always get paid. The cure for that, but it's a difficult one, but we started uh, this way as FIFPRO. We say to those players, and we put it on our website, don't go there. So we have a negative transfer advice. I also can shortly address the outcome of other academic research. In the session with Mario Sismek, we had a question about the, the matches that were fixed. Was there anything at stake in those matches, those last seven matches? And he said, well, we were already relegated. But that's uh, also something which is uh, imp quite important. The less there is at stake, the, less, uh, the, the more vulnerable uh, players are to fix a match because they think if nothing is at stake, what uh, do I care? And uh, if I can get the money then. And what do you, do you do about this? Create playoff systems. Because with a playoff system, at every match in the playoff, something is at stake. So this also can give an extra threshold to fight match fixing. Another thing we are working on is at the European level. We received a grant from the uh, European Commission, and it's called the Don't Fix It Project. We do it together with uh, Burbeck University, and we involve eight countries and nine federations, and we try to work on a, uh, a prevention, a code of conduct for players, and also we have a project going on which brings us into the dressing room of the players, because there you can reach them. We also had the previous uh, campaign show racism the red card, and now we want to rebuild this and show match fixing the red card, so we can easily copy the concept of this uh, campaign. We work with an ambassador model, we have uh, famous players, legends, and uh, we try to uh, have them in our campaign. We also are looking very much into young players and their problems because they are extra vulnerable. Outside of the education program, we can think of um, the FIFA TMS syste system, which means the uh, transfer matching system for minors. There's a close watch from FIFA. Transfers from very young players are prohibited under the age of uh, 16. And there we are also, also participating in. And of course, we have the contacts with our colleagues from Cricket, FICA, where we copy their online training program and uh, also try to learn from their code of conduct. A very important uh, project we is also pending. That's uh, a, an alert system for players. Um, 
where they can uh, report uh, safely and anonymously. We see the FIFA and the UEFA hotlines and several countries, they also have a, a hotline to report in place, but the conclusion is that those systems do not work. FIFPRO is financing this system, and we do it in combination with the early warning system of the betting company, and uh, we do it at the moment uh, we are testing in Finland. Another group we are addressing are the former players, because also they are important. They are a role model for the miners, and they are also looking at uh, organized crime, a way to get into the match. Those players, when we look at them, there's uh, research and reports from ESPN and Sports Illustrated telling us that um, in general, within nine years after their career, the professional players lost all their money because they keep on living like they are still playing. So that's uh, one of the problems. So having uh, measures in place for this is also important. And we can look at, for instance, a model uh, also in place in Holland is the career fund. This reduces the risk. Y when you look at um, the, the career fund, you can say, well, in combination with the second career education, like for instance, the FIFRO uh, Academy, based in Denmark, uh, by the way. We can have a career fund in place where you can say that uh, a player from his uh, end of a sporting career to a new career uh, has a kind of transition. And also, this is a part of uh, the old age pension. Another uh, initiative uh, taken is um, debt counseling. Because players with debts, they are vulnerable. And if you can help them with that, you can also reduce the risk in doing this, and you can keep out the organized criminals. So you can help them within the legal system, if there's a law on debt counseling, but also outside them. And also the career fund in uh, several countries, we see that they help fighting debts of players. The European Social Dialogue, in that uh, we uh, address the problem of the, the, the contracts not being written. We have a minimum requirement standard in place uh, where we, and we uh, try to uh, implement those uh, minimum requirements in every country in the European Union with the support of the European uh, Commission and with the support of UEFA. The problem, however, is that our uh, social partners, EPFL and ECA, they are quite reluctant on this field. We have um, asked what is the follow-up on the Black Book. Well, um, a black book for Western Europe would be an ID, but it, uh, I cannot announce that yet, but maybe it will happen. But cooperation and uh, with our partners in sport, with uh, in the European Commission and Europol is uh, something we do. We have a permanent attendance uh, for the subject on our website. And uh, well, we get some pressure on the responsible entities. We see that UEFA is sanctioning um, clubs which are involved in um, uh, not complying with the financial fair play. But, of course, FIFPRO is a players organization and not a governing body. The last issue I would like to address is the uh, rehabilitation, because we really need that. We see that if you have something to offer to the players uh, who are involved, they will be prepared to talk with the uh, law enforcement in order to fight max fixing. We had a good experience in England many years ago looking at the addiction. I can uh, remember Paul Merson who was addicted to everything you can be addicted to. He was not punished, but he was rehabilitated. He was guided and came back to the match and even his opponents were very happy with that. So also there, I think, uh, looking also at the doping system, uh, there's a role for WADA to reverse here and uh, we need uh, another approach and, uh, well, in fact, the players are not the criminals, the players are the victims. Thank you. And now I'd like to welcome Darko Koss. Uh, he's from the appointed head of the OECD Working Group on Bribery. So, take the word. Well, good evening. You know, it's... It looks fine when you get a very loose title to fill in, but when you have to start thinking how to do it, it, it becomes problematic. So what I did was 
since my life runs parallelly, the first path is professional way. I was throu throughout my life I am fighting for criminality and now corruption, but I was an active in sport all the time. So I, I chose, I chosen some of the events which really happened in my life, and try try and I'm trying to deduct now some something out of it which I now know that is important to fight uh, in the fight against match fixing. So first, I was a young goalkeeper. And here I don't have to spend some too many words because uh, uh, because my colleagues from Fifth Pro and uh, the ex Croatian players spoke about social conditions and the economic conditions which players live. What we were doing in my time, I used to live very close to Austrian borders, and that Sevina then was part of. Uh, communist country in the, by the name of Yugoslavia. Of course, soccer players in Yugoslavia did not get paid at all. And we were practicing at least once a day. So what, what we were doing is we were trying to sell as many as our, our players to Austria to get salary there. So, of course, all those players had to undergo a test match. And they usually were put into the Austrian team playing against our team. And since I was a goalkeeper, it was very, very easy for me to make an agreement with the player who wanted to be sold to Austria, <laughs> I do my best that you will get the contract. I must say, it never, it never worked. I was always the best player of the match. Whatever I do to, to escape the ball, always got it. So it never worked, but some of the players got the contract. It's very simple. You see, if players do not get money for what they're doing for months, they're open for everything, including match fixing. So we heard this part already, but what can we do? You see, lic licensing of clubs for the next season is fine, but players don't get everything, anything out of it. If the club cannot play in the next season in the first division again, because it is not fulfilling its obligation to the players, fine, players still don't get the money. So we have to do something in advance. And this, there are different solutions, there are different models. We saw some of them some min minutes ago, but you see, if German clubs are self, self regulating the issue, uh, we cannot expect this from the clubs in, let's say, especially not in the Eastern Europe. They're not interested in it. So, and the state, the state institutions can't do it either. So they have to be the soccer or football associations, if you speak about soccer, and other sport associations too. So we have to take care of this one. Otherwise, we will keep on losing the battle, especially in the areas where the athletes don't get paid. Then I became an UEFA referee. And one of my, also, UEFA referees got a call before he had a match in Macedonia. It was a call from Bulgaria, and the guy on the other, stand, uh, other side told him, listen, if the away team will win 3-1, you will get so much money. Since my colleague knew that I'm a police officer, he called me and tell, asked me what to do. I said, okay, wait. I called to EFA. There was always an open line, not special for match fixing, but, uh, but for any event which can cause problems to UEFA. And I got somebody on the other side, and he said, sorry, this is not our problem. You will have to deal with it in, some other in, in any other way. Okay, fine. I called the police. Police said, well, we cannot prove it. This was the answer which I expected because I was the investigator too, so I, I knew it was difficult to, to, to prove it. But then the, the question came, and the, the police officer said, okay, can you tell me what UEFA will do about it because you have informed UEFA? I said, nothing. And then, okay, so what do you expect from us to do? It is mainly the problem of, of UEFA. The, the story is very simple. You see, it is not the law enforcement agencies which have to act first. Sport organizations have to deal with the issue. And nowadays, betting operators too. So it doesn't make any sense to speak anything about match fixing if we don't involve at least three interlocutors. Law enforcement agencies, sports organizations, and betting regulators and operators. Otherwise, we will go, we will continue to follow our directions, but we will never come together. We heard today, let's say, the representative of betting operators, they're doing a great job. FIFPRO is doing a great job. What I'm missing here is 
how do they work together? And if you will not work together, it will make no sense. Uh, Mr. Chairman of the Slovenia and the Corruption Commission, I've been approached by a soccer player from the first professional soccer league in Slovenia. He has been approached by match fixers, including some of his teammates, to fix the match. He didn't want to do it. He approached his coach. And since the coach didn't want to listen to it, he approached the chairman of the club. No reaction. So he came to us. He reported the case. We reported the case to the police because we did not have any investigative powers. The police started to investigate. And although we did not mention the name of the player, as soon as the police started to investigate, he has been fired on spot from the club. And not only that, the club took everything that he never was able to get any contract anymore in Slovenia to play soccer. So he had, he had to retire at age of 24. So when we speak about fighting ma match fixing, you know, who are the most important partners for the most important actors of it? Athletes, players, it themselves. And it should not stay only with words. You know, when we speak about protection of players, it's not only enough to legally protect them. Already on the state level, we have very few countries which are able to legally protect their whistleblowers in any kind of area. But when you speak about whistleblowers in sport, it gets even more complicated because state itself cannot interfere directly with the regulations of sports organizations. And this is only one part of the job. The second part is even more important. We have to practically protect them. It is not only about having, let's say, secure hotlines to report whistleblowing. Sometimes on the basis of the information given, I can easily tell you who gave the information. So they, ha they have to be protected in practical terms. And without that, we will have some serious problems with engaging soccer players to report on wrongdoings in the future. Uh, as an independent expert now, I've been engaged by the Council of Europe, by the UNODC, to help them with, let's say, preparation of some documents against match fixing. And what I found there, it was really surprising. You see, there were, there were countries which s strongly opposed the idea to adopt new legal rules against match fixing. And I'm not talking about strange countries from Africa or South America. I'm talking about extremely developed Western European countries. They were against it. And even more countries were against the idea to have, let's say, uh, somebody called it today, international platform for the exchange of ideas, best practices, and so on. So the international body which would deal with anti-match fixing. And then, luckily, I, I did a big uh, study for the UN ODC how the legal things are being solved in this area. I can tell you in Europe, we can survive with the existing criminal legislation. But when we speak about worldwide solutions, we are far from settled. There are countries which have extremely good legal provisions. Let's say South Africa is one of the best ones. United States, Japan for professional soccer. Uh, there are countries which don't have anything. There are countries which are trying to, to, to achieve something now. Let's say Russia, obviously in preparation for the future big sporting event, they, they are, have adopted a really very strict uh, laws against match fixing. But talking globally, we need something. And since we are facing new challenges, challenges we need new solutions too. As UEFA and FIFA referee observer, I came across the cases where players were fixing matches not to earn money through betting schemes, but just to help their friends to avoid, to avoid relegation or to win the championship. Sometimes they got paid for it, sometimes they did not get paid for it. If they're getting paid for it, you now we have sometimes very interesting situations. If somebody's paying a club, a players of another club to lose the match, it's match fixing. What about if they're paying the club not to lose the match, to do what they have to do so-and-so? to fight honestly. Is this match fixing too? I, should it be punished too? Well, legal theory, in legal theory, everything is clear. It has to be punished too. But 
what about if they do it because they like the other team or because they know that they will get the favor back in the next year? Should they be punished too? I, I saw many different approaches, let's say, from the IOC, from the UNODC, from UEFA. Uh, you know, some, some, of the, some people were saying, well, it doesn't matter. Match fixing, if you match fixing, they have to go to jail. That means you have to criminalize it as a criminal offense. Law enforcement agencies have to take care of it. And there are some other approaches saying, this is nothing. We, we can't even deal with it. So as, you, as usual, the, tru the truth is some uh, in between. We, if we speak about match fixing, of course, at the first glance, we always think about match fixing as a criminal offense, being called as a fraud or corruption, whatever. But criminal offense. Why? This is not necessary. Such cases of match fixing are something which do not have the criminal, let's say, the, they're not so dangerous for the society at, at large that state would have to interfere. With other words, no need to engage law enforcement agencies for such cases of match fixing. But somebody has to react, and those are sports organizations. And if sports organizations do not react, it means they're not interested on what is going on uh, in their sport. You saw, let's say, the cases of uh, badminton players in the last Olympics. This is a perfect example of how a sports organization has to react. It is not crime to, to lose deliberately, but it is breaching the ethics of sport, and somebody has to do something. And this somebody are sports organizations. And at the end, uh, although this is not part of my presentation, it was not part of my planned presentation, we must not forget how important the sport is and how important, let's say, the, the indiv individuals who are at the top of s certain sport organizations are as a role model. Since Mr. Platini is sharing UEFA, UEFA is doing many, many things. And thanks to Mr. Platini, now Council of Europe has started the endeavor to develop a new convention against match fixing. Without him, I don't think er anything would move. He had to come to Strasbourg to convince the representatives of the state. And what is interesting is that usually the rep representatives of the ministries of sport were always in favor of having new international legal instrument. Representatives of the Ministry of Justice they were saying, oh no, we don't need another yet another convention. And then they were fighting each other. On the other hand, we have the case of FIFA. And whatever FIFA does nowadays, nobody trusts it, trust it. And we all know why. They have even engaged, engaged let's say, the best anti-corruption experts of the world to assist them, mainly to improve the image. It didn't fly. So we must not forget that, that each of us who is active in the area of sport is a role model for our youngsters. And we have to behave so. We cannot preach something and do something else. And this goes for the big guys up there too. Thank you very much. Now we have a little change in the program. Uh, in the program, Nick Garlick should have been here to talk about uh, how match fixers operate and what the police can do. But we have a worthy substitute tonight, namely uh, Dale Shin, who's going to talk about combating match fixing and European Interpol. Welcome, and the word is yours. Thank you very much. I've been called a lot of things, but never little and substitute before, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've um, spoke to a lot of people as the last speaker before lunch, uh, but rarely before last uh, call for free alcohol. So. I will try my best to uh, get everybody on their way. It is a pleasure to be here tonight. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Dale Sheehan. I'm an assistant commissioner with the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, and I am seconded to Interpol as uh, director of capacity building and training. One of those programs which I'm here to speak to you tonight about is our Integrity in Sports initiative. For those of you that are not aware, Interpol and FIFA agreed on a 10-year joint initiative in May 2011 to enhance global efforts to tackle match-fixing and corruption in sport. 
I'd like to acknowledge our friend Declan Hill, who without a doubt raised the issue of match fixing onto the international stage. I would I also like to acknowledge uh, Chris Eaton, who in 2010 with FIFA had the foresight to realize that in order to combat this problem, there needed to be partnerships and integration, and he identified Interpol as a partner. Since then, two years of hard work and extensive research by our integrity and sport team have accumulated in new exciting projects through capacity building and training, in-depth programs to educate key stakeholders concerning the dangers, often through organized crime, have been developed and implemented. Since the inception of the program, we have reached out to over 160 countries with participants coming from many of those as well as much more. These included training events, workshop, awareness conferences, and specialized training courses. It's been rewarding to see the positive outcomes from these events and the engagement of participants who have put the knowledge and skills they've acquired into practice. This year, Interpol authored a second training needs assessment in partnership with others to reassess the global impact of match fixing. Some of the results indicated that match fixing in football still remains a global challenge and is growing and incidents were reported in more than 70 countries across six continents this past year alone. We also confirmed in consultation with our law enforcement agencies of 119 member Interpol countries that there was a requirement for law enforcement officers and a skill set needed to set up a program on specialized training for law enforcement officers in investigative techniques, understanding illegal betting markets, coordinating with international partners, and we since then have designed and implemented and piloted that training course and we are expanding our delivery of same. Year two of the project has been dedicated to the development and implementation of the program. The second phase focuses on design and development of e-learning and face-to-face -face training of key targets of match fixing through prevention, national and regional workshops, various communication mechanisms, as well as expert meetings. These activities have complemented other Interpol initiatives to form a holistic approach to tackle match fixing internationally. From an operational context, Interpol has been and is very, very busy worldwide. We have assisted and coordinated approximately 2,360 arrests in several Asian countries, more than 7,000 arrests and raids, closure of illegal gambling dens, which handled more than 2 billion in illegal bets, and over 27 million in cash seized. This is a true indication of partnerships, integration, and teamwork between law enforcement agencies, betting agencies, and football associations. I do not stand here tonight to tell you that I have one solution. There is clearly not one solution. But to better tackle match fixing, we need a strategy which covers all aspects. Therefore, we have implemented based on consultation and feedback from others, five key elements. The need for partnerships. The global nature of match fixing necessitates that partnerships between stakeholders need to be effective, national, regional, and international. Information. All partners, stakeholders, key actors, and targets need general information about match fixing that there is a shared understanding of the problem. Coordination. Given the number of stakeholders involved, it is imperative that the stakeholders operate in a coordinated manner to ensure a comprehensive approach to combat match fixing. I can assure you as a police officer that organized crime does just that. Prevention. Prevention is the primary aim of our initiative to tackle match fixing and corruption in football. Prevention measures include awareness raising, training, and education. And proactivity anticipating threats and putting the necessary preventative measures in place for the long-term preservation of integrity in football. 
Again, this is not the list that is the be-all, end-all, but I do believe it is a start. Last month, Interpol launched a series of e-learning programs aimed at educating players, coaches, and referees on the dangers of match fixing to help them become, avoid becoming victims of this threat to football integrity. The online programs, each focusing on a different group often targeted by match fixing, offer an in interactive guide on how to recognize, resist, and report attempts at match fixing and related issues. These programs are available in five languages on both the Interpol and FIFA websites, and I encourage you to take a look at them. The programs are also designed to be used by FIFA's member associations as one part of their existing integrity training or as standalone training programs if desired. They also form part of a wider effort to preserve football from the growing threat of match fixing. In closing, I am an optimist. You will no doubt hear from pessimists, and we can all be pessimists, but I do, do believe that everyone, and I mean everyone, wants what is best for football and sports. So we must move forward together. Perhaps not all at a pace that we are all comfortable with, or maybe not as fast as we hope, but I do believe everybody wants better. You have heard tonight from Dick Pound and William Bach, two speakers, two of several speakers who simply have not stopped because they believe in the integrity in sport. And I do believe that if we all work together, we can all do that. Thank you very much. Okay, it's now open for questions. We have, luckily, reasonable amount of time. We're not going to leave here until 9.30. Well, we have time for that, at least. So I will open for questions. Please, gentlemen over there. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Johnny from the Danish School of Media and Journalism. I have a question for you, Mr. Van Wiegen. Um, you ended your session saying that um, players are the vic victims and not the criminals. Um, they do have a choice, even though under pressure, to, to say no to match fixing. But, but why do you think they are the, vic the victims? Well, of course, they, they in theory, they have a choice. But looking at practice and uh, Scenario Sysmax uh, this uh, afternoon described, there's no place to go to, there are no mechanisms in place to do something really, um, the really the right thing. And even the players who do the right thing, I can tell you uh, about uh, Simone Farina, he's the kind of uh, FIFA ambassador who did the right thing. The fact was, was that uh, the, the result of his uh, doing the right thing was his the end of his career. So we need uh, uh, good programs in order to protect the players, otherwise, no system will work. Okay, I think we have uh, we have at least two questions from here and three questions from over here. Could you please raise your hand again? And uh, the, the man with the microphone can see you. Hello, panel. Uh, my name is Kevin Carpenter. I'm a, I'm a sports lawyer specialising in integrity issues for, for Hill Dickinson. Mine's a question to the whole panel relating to the relationship between different integrity offences, and we've heard today about anti-doping and about match-fixing. Um, one of my um, issues about sanctioning for match-fixing, for whether it's players, referees, managers, whoever it may be, is the, is the zero-tolerance approach in match-fixing, and that basically means a life ban uh, for a first offence. Um, as we know, the, the water code is going to be tightened to make a four-year ban for a first offence. But what I think in football particularly, there is, a, and tennis and other sports, there's a failure to understand the uh, redemptive uh, effect that a, a ban can have and people can come back and uh, reform and come back to the sport. Um, and I think there's a lack of proportionality as regards sanctioning by, by governing bodies and by courts. Um, what's your view on this? Because I know that generally it's seen as the biggest evil and therefore only a life ban is, is the way forward. Question was put to or just to, to come everyone. To everyone, please. Uh, let, let, let me let me start. I think that uh, 
quite frankly, in the sense of, of betting fraud initiated match fixing, the penalties to players are almost irrelevant. We are seeing uh, uh, every day a large number of fixed football outcomes particularly, but in all sports as well. And there is no prevention of this at the criminal level by sanctioning players. I don't really have a great deal of, uh, of interest other than what sports should do, should do to protect itself from players who are repeat offenders or players who, uh, who are, you know, quite frankly, flaunting themselves and flaunting their, uh, their, their commitment to sport. But, I mean, you only have to look at the recent case in Australia where uh, six UK players or more were, in fact, arrested uh, for uh, match-fixing in Australia with a, a crime that was planned both in, uh, in Hungary and in, uh, in Singapore and paid for by people out of China. Uh, the real issue here is you are not going to prevent it solely by sports sanctioning players in any way. Sanctioning must be proportionate to, the, uh, to the, the benefit it has in prevention terms. The real issue here is the criminality that is external to sport and what you do about that. And that is where governments are properly failing. Properly failing. Please, Dr. Just on, I just go on, let, uh, let you stop. You see, uh, in Europe, as I said, we, things can be covered, although sometimes it's great difficulties. You remember the, the famous case of referee Hoiser from Germany. He was sentenced, in the first instance, he was sentenced for fraud. Then, then the prosecutor appealed against the decision of the court saying, sorry, this is not fraud. He, he has to be released. Then the, the second court instance, they, they have said, no, you're wrong. This is fraud and the sentence has been confirmed. So if we see such problems already in case of Germany, which basically traditionally is a very well legally functioning state, you can imagine what problems we see in other countries. There are countries which do not even fulfill the basic requirement that match fixing would be considered as part of organized crime. That means four years of imprisonment for the commission of the offense. And this is something which we have to achieve in the future. You see, we cannot say that in all the countries uh, sanctions would have to be the same, but at least they would have to fulfill the basic requirements. It means effective, proportionate, and decisive. And as a little bit minimum of minimum, we can take those four years based on the UN Convention Against National, International Organized Crime. It gets even more complicated if you, if you go around the globe, having in mind the criminal sanctions. In China, you can easily get uh, killed for committing criminal offense of corruption, which also understand uh, match fixing. In some countries, you will get through with very light penalty. And when we start to, to speak about the sanctions which can be imposed by the sports organizations, then you know, the variety of sanctions is even bigger. And uh, here it will be even more difficult because nobody can force sports organizations to impose this kind of sanction or another one. It is comple completely up to their, let's say, discretion. Unless international sports organizations will uh, agree on something, and then this, this might be a, a good step forward. The lack, the lack of proportionality is really a problem, uh, and um, especially when you look at uh, the, the fact that the career of a professional athlete is uh, 10 years on average. So this, this is not the answer uh, to, the, to, to this uh, question. So proportionality is really important. And, and also um, you have to realize that, um, well, for an amateur player, uh, a live ban has a different impact than for a professional player because he has to earn his living. So, in fact, you can look at uh, human uh, rights or fundamental rights. Uh, they are infringed uh, more for a professional player than uh, for an amateur player. So, also there you can look at uh, proportionality. Yes. Any other from the panel want to address a question? Okay, I had at least four questions left on my... Could you... Please rise when you have the microphone so all the audience can see you. Thank you very much indeed. Hello. Uh, yes. Yes. Good. Uh, my name is uh, Deborah Unger. I'm from Transparency International, the anti-corruption organization. And I wanted to just ask a bit more detail about the whistleblower protection that two of the speakers mentioned. 
uh, Will Van Leeuwen was talking about an alert system that was being trialed in Finland and mentioned that the systems that he knew of through FIFA, etc., UEFA, weren't good. I'd like him to I, say why he thinks that's not, they aren't good. And also to perhaps someone on the panel to think of what might be a good whistleblowing system. Does anyone want to step up? Yes, please. Yeah, well, looking at uh, the, the project in Finland, uh, well, you just uh, heard, heard my colleague say that uh, when um, there was a player reporting and uh, everyone knows who was th the one and um, the end of uh, his career was uh, already there before uh, the, the case became, uh, became public. So there, the, the protection is, is really important and when you have a system, uh, and I can reveal some, uh, some of the things, it's, about, it's called the Red Button uh, Project and uh, players, uh, they, can, uh, have an, they have an app on their uh, smartphone and they can report uh, irregularities uh, like this and they can do it completely anonymous. So this means that uh, the, there is a, a, a reporting uh, room, is a, an independent organization and uh, it's, it's in cooperation with uh, the betting industry uh, in Finland and then they can look if there are irregularities in the betting patterns and uh, if they're not, nothing will happen. If, th if it happens, then they have other, uh, because they're already warned, they have signals that something uh, was, uh, was going on looking at, uh, at the match fixing. So uh, in fact, there you have a rather safe uh, reporting uh, system uh, in place for, for players uh, who, who are in fact looking at the regulations. Uh, they are uh, obliged to report in case they are approached. So uh, we think this is a, it's not a solution, but it's another step in the protection of players. Well, when countries are protecting whistleblowers, they usually do, they usually protect whistleblowers from the public sector. And as far as I know, there's only one country in the world which considers sport as being part of the public sector, and that's Slovakia, where the court has said that uh, refereeing in soccer is so important because it, it is attracting, let's say, the attention of so many people that it is considered to be a public sector activity. But even if the case is that the public sector is, is protecting whistleblowing, whistleblowers, you know, this can happen only uh, at the level of public institutions. So what, what, wha what happens when it comes to the problem of the, the club, concrete club? You know, the state cannot interfere. And I would say so that if something like this happens, I it is already too late. We'll have to engage in many more activities, not only raising the awareness of players, we'll, ha we'll also have to include the sport, sport functionaires, coaches, as, as, as Interpol is doing nowadays. Because they all have to know, they all have to understand that if whistleblowing happens in their club, it is not their first task to decapitate the whistleblower. It is their first task to assist him and to prevent similar events to happen in the future too. But that, of course, will take some time. No easy solutions here, I'm afraid. Can, can, can I respond by saying that, that FIFA have a proposal in 2012 for a whistleblower protection system. Whistleblower protection is, there are some excellent models out there. They are mostly out of, uh, out of what we'll call developed countries, for the sake of a better term, countries that have the money for it. And they're all about really uh, relocating witnesses and, uh, and in some cases even a dramatic uh, use of uh, new identities, etc. Uh, of course, FIFA and football and sport generally find that sort of the notion you know, ridiculous. How would, could we relocate a player? How could we re-identify a, a player? Uh, but necessarily, if you have a major problem, if your culture is so infected by endemic corruption, then you must do something, even if it's a temporary uh, solution, something to protect players uh, in any sport. But I think football is the most threatened sport in the world today. Uh, and, and that might mean doing something dramatic like that. It might mean about relocating players to friendly countries, uh, to private clubs. Because inevitably we see the case of Farina. Farina is a, a perfect example, really. Farina was not the only player, by the way, in Italy to reject the approach from most people at all. There are other Italian players who rejected the approach, but they didn't speak out. Well, you see, they're still playing. 
So this ought to horrify sport administrators. It ought to horrify people normally in society. But uh, we have example of, uh, of uh, Mario today and Sizzling and others talking about the penalties that the, the whistleblowers are paying. I don't know what the answer is except to say that it has to be taken seriously and that, that, that FIFA, if any uh, sport organisation is in a position to do something different, it is in fact FIFA because of the size of the sport, the spread of the sport and the multinationality of it. Uh, but ultimately there has to be a culture of rejection infused into sport. Players should have this cultural belief, this is horrifying, why would they fix a match? They've got to have an automatic response of, of rejection. And this, is a and this does not exist. The Black Book showed that. Lots of other investigations around the world have shown that there is not a culture of rejection in football. To a large extent, there's a, a, a culture of benign acceptance, of, of, of even tired acceptance of the reality. We talk about players who, uh, who aren't paid properly. Goodness me, go to Africa and Central America where players get $100 a month to play professional football. Please. You know, there is right and there is wrong. Someone has to realise that wrong is plain and simply wrong. To pay a person and say that this makes you less able to, be, to consider a, th a thing wrong is got to be the wrong moral, th moral standard to take. It is either wrong or it's right, not in the middle, because you're paid more. Thank you. We have four questions over here, two questions over here. I have identified the four questions, uh, persons over here, but I have not yet seen. Could you please uh, show your hands if you have persons over here who have not had the opportunity to raise a question? Okay, we only have four questions over here. Please rise. Uh, Chris Arl, USA, Main Sport Handball. Uh, we have heard appropriately several speakers tonight talk about the importance of protecting vulnerable players, particularly those who might be in desperate need of uh, money and be willing to listen to temptation. Why is it then that betting companies, the legal ones I'm talking about, who uh, proclaim wanting to reduce or try to eliminate as much as possible match fixing are more and more engaging in forms of betting that play straight into the hands of players who without much risk for detection and without feeling that they affect the final outcome of their match, losing their, uh, the game intentionally. Uh, in other words, I'm talking about spot betting, where you bet on who gets the first yellow card, what is the halftime result, in which limit is the first corner kick. It seems that this form of betting in is designed to increase the prevalence of match fixing. Thank you. Perhaps you uh, go first, Chris, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, I would probably respond with an answer and said that how many of you have, have said to a friend who, who will run the fastest in, uh, in 50 meters or who will go to the bar and could we make a 20 Danish pound bet on that one? That's kind of the bet size that we have with the first yellow card or the throw in or what it's called. It's kind of fun bet. Um, if, if you want, want to bet, on those kind of of uh, bets, then you can you're allowed to bet probably 100 Danish pounds. So that's not where we see the real match fixing. The real match fixing is in 1x2, is in totals. That's the number of goals, and that is, is on the Asian handicap. Can, can I answer too by saying that spot betting is next to nothing. This this issue of yellow cards, first out, uh, first player replaced. No money internationally is made on that. No serious money is made by that. We're talking millions of dollars that are made on end results, which is why you're seeing these goals, the 95th minute or the, the 87th minute, you know, all done by signals from the ground, hats off, heads on, all these things that are well documented around the world today and still happen <laughs> every day. You know, handball has had its problems too, we know, but it's not, it's not spot fixing your problem, that's the end result that is your problem too. We are seeing a new emergence of the accumulator bet, which has a real issue for uh, tennis, table tennis and, uh, and badminton for instance, where people are betting on 10 instances for instance in a competition or a day's play. It might be the second set to be won by player A, the third game on, play on, on the game three will be won at, uh, at, at love, etc. Now these are a small bet 
for a massive outcome if you can corrupt players to do the three difficult ones that he accumulated there. This will creep into football and other sports like handball ultimately. The accumulated debt is different to what's happening today, which is essentially criminals putting on a large amount of money to make a large amount of money or a far larger amount of money. Don't worry about your spot fixing, please. But the accumulated debt is something you should be thinking about. Okay, thank you. Can the gentleman from Beach Rock? Klaus Egelund from Exploit here in Denmark. Um, I was just wondering, you were talking about uh, identifying matches being fixed and outcomes being fixed, but you don't go public with these. Why don't you go public and does the panel agree that it's the right way to go ahead, that you uh, keep the secrecy about uh, possible fixes uh, just because you can't prove it? Isn't the transparency and, and uh, the public eye being on this the way ahead? Did I say it? Uh, well, I said it, sorry. Okay. I don't recall saying it's such a thing, but uh, no, as far as I'm concerned, absolute transparency is absolutely vital in, uh, in, uh, in the activities of sporting bodies. If I said such a thing, I'm surprised. Must have been, but... No, yeah, but but, but, but we, we are saying it to the sports government and the right and police enforcement. I think that's quite uh, clear that, that we're going with the to, to where it have to be. This will, yeah, government have to know it. Uh, football Federation have to know it. Uh, we are and we are not saying a match fix is fixed. We are saying there is a possible possible match fixing. Uh, th this is the the indicators of match fixing is what you're talking about. Where the indicators should be reported. Well, I think they should be reported, quite frankly. And I think the more that you report these uh, these indicators, and I understand why the business of betting doesn't uh, uh, accede to that. Why the business of betting this is the negative to business, you know. And let's be honest, betting is a business, as sport is a business. Uh, much of the negativity about reporting and taking hard action about match fixing is because sport is protecting its business and betting is protecting its business. That's the role of governments to start putting some morality into those two organisations to, uh, to see this in a, in, a, in a way that prevents by shaming people who do these things. I mean, shaming has a very important role to play, a very important role. Now, I firmly believe that uh, all these indicators should be listed somewhere, even if they are t just that, indicators, so that everyone sees, well, someone did pick something up. They haven't got anything uh, out for criminal proof. This is the problem when you, you rely particularly on prosecution as the only solution match fixing. Come on. Prosecution is not the solution for anything, really, quite frankly. It's, it is a solution of some kind, an end result. The best solution is prevention by showing you are really caring about your organisation and you're going to watch these people who are actually, uh, you know, raping it in many respects. And uh, you're not about waiting for the... Look, the Bochum investigation is a very important investigation in Germany. It is now in its fourth year. When's it going to finish? Sorry, when's it going to finish? Wh when, when is the investigation in, in, uh, in uh, Hungary going to finish? People are still fixing matches. People are still fixing uh, in the same countries they're investigating. The issue here is about doing something that prevents it. In that, some cases by saying, we know what's happening, we can't prove it in a court of law, but we're watching this very closely. These are the indicators we have, betting indicators, uh, source information from criminal organisations. I mean, why is sport frightened about doing that? Why is sport frightened about actually asking the very people who are fixing matches how they do it? We, we heard today from, from Mario. He could just as well have been a criminal doing that. But these criminals, in fact, the people who are not getting penalised are the criminals. We see Paramal Raz sitting there in a hotel room in, uh, in Hungary and, and living it up the nightlife in, uh, in, in Hungary. Come on, he's a, he's a convicted match fixer. What is this all about? I understand he's talking to some journalist about writing a book. You know, well, well goodness me. There, there are, in fact, laws in some countries that prevent criminals from making money out of their crime. But not here. Well done, Paramal. Let's make you a confounded uh, a celebrity, a star. Sorry, I've gone off the track a little bit, but you understand what I, what I, I see here. The prosecutions are the, are the last step in a very long series of steps, but police have an absolute, uh, and I'm a policeman, so I can tell with authority, they have a love affair with prosecutions, with heads on spikes. No, stop it. Stop it from happening. How do you think we defeated terrorism? By prosecuting them? No, by stopping it from happening. Thank you, Bill Eason. Are there any either from the panel who wants to comment it? Thank you. I think we have a lady down here. Thank you. 
Uh, I'm Frederic Wienia, FIFA, the World Players Union. I have a question for Dale Sheen from Interpol. Um, it was with much interest that I learned about your program for uh, e-learning for different target groups within professional football. My question is, will it be mandatory for uh, all the uh, target groups? Uh, we know we have some interested, um, interesting uh, experiences in cricket where the players have to uh, do every year a test, an e-learning test before they can be registered as professional player. And I'm wondering uh, what your thoughts about it uh, with your e-learning program. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, all, all of these programs have been uh, designed in consultation with, with FIFA. Um, as a, a career police officer and uh, uh, someone that's devoted a, a large portion of my lifetime to training and development, um, I know what my personal recommendation uh, would be, but certainly it, it wouldn't be for uh, Interpol to determine or decide what is uh, mandatory or not. Um, I do know uh, in other areas uh, that I have worked, um, the appropriate agency has uh, dictated and decided and enforced what should be, be mandatory and, and what shouldn't. So um, it is a very interesting conversation and one in which uh, I would more than happily uh, engage with you uh, to get that outcome. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sasso Baiwan and I'm a journalist. Um, just before I ask my question, I just wanted to make a bit of a comment. If the financial repercussions of being honest outweighs the moral applause that people get for exposing what is wrong. Is there any way that we can effectively tackle the problem of match fixing? Because you just mentioned what happened with Simone Farina. He has no career anymore. I mean, that's a very high price for somebody to pay for being honest. I mean, during the, before or during the African Cup of Nations, I had the opportunity to talk with the former head of the South African or the former head of referees for SAFA, the South African Football Association, who has also been kept out of the refereeing structures ever since he's made his revelations about match fixing. And you talk to these people and you see them have a sense of despondence about the fact that they have not been able to go on with their careers after revealing what they said. What does that say about the state of sport, that whistleblowers cannot stay in the professions if they're honest. Thank you. Uh, can you take that first question? Uh, front oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. South Africa has a very interesting history, doesn't it? And the, uh, the lead up to the World Cup in 2010, there are still six outstanding uh, investigational reports of, uh, of match fixing on the international friendlies before the World Cup commenced. And South Africa has been talking about running a quasi-judicial inquiry that now for the last 12 months and we're still not seeing the inquiry and this is now 2013 I think you can count backwards and see how fast the uh, the wheels of, uh, of so-called internal justice move uh, two things I'll say in almost any walk of life whistleblowing is hard you look at international business you look at uh, you know uh, people who've uh, done whistleblowing on chemical industry on the pharmaceutical industry on uh, cigarettes etc uh, it's it's inevitably very difficult to be a whistleblower uh, in sport because there is just no appetite uh, to look at this in a global way. And I think the solution, and my personal view is, the solution should be global. I think South Africa tells us another lesson when we look at the truth commissions that occurred in South Africa uh, after apartheid uh, finally uh, met its death. And uh, we saw really an opportunity for everyone to confess their, uh, their implications and to try to reconcile. I really believe football's at that stage today. I think football's at a stage where it needs a global truth commission to invite players, to invite referees, to invite the administrators, because don't forget a lot of administrators involved here, don't just look at players, a lot of administrators, a lot of federations, a lot of clubs, a lot of leagues, where people in charge are making decisions about who referees what, who plays what, who they play against, where the friendlies, who referees international friendlies, for instance. Very important decisions if you're going to fix a match. These people should be given an opportunity to cleanse and to say what happened and to allow the, 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 the sport to, uh, to put in place you know, uh, uh, provisions that are long-standing and deeply seated to prevent 
a, re a, a repeat of it was occurred in football. I think football is in a dire state. That's my personal opinion on development. Other comments? Yeah. It's a very difficult uh, problem uh, you uh, you mentioned here, and um, as, as Chris has been uh, just uh, explaining, uh, there's no hard to, to solve this, but on the other hand, uh, protection uh, will work even under the most difficult uh, circumstances, and even in the situation you mentioned, uh, just football is a team sport, only a few players are mo most of the time involved in match fixing, there are other ones who do not get involved in match fixing under the same circumstances, and that's something we have to learn from. So, uh, in fact, this, this will be, together with prevention, uh, the way to, to look at this problem. But it will be difficult and it will stay difficult. There's one last question down there. The lady in the yellow. Hi, Pam Boltler, Women Can International, United States. Have any of you, or perhaps um, Mr. Um, Von Meegen, considered the United Nations Human Rights Council as a potential partner? It looks like you're trying to forge partnerships with Interpol and other organizations, but to truly make this a global, to help make it a global conversation, the United Nations Human Rights Council? We didn't, uh, uh, we didn't, uh, but uh, it, it could be an idea because everything will help. But uh, first we have to, to identify it, uh, the problem as a, as a fundamental or human rights uh, issue. And that's uh, also a step we have to take and uh, we are working on that, uh, as you could uh, hear in my, uh, one of my previous answers. But thank you for uh, informing us about it. Just can I respond to that first by saying that there are many other international organisations at the UN level that are engaged. UNESCO, UNODC, uh, UNICRI, to name only three, who are engaged in corruption in sport and seeking solutions of a, of a global nature. So uh, there's not devoid of international organisations that are interested in participating and helping to design solutions. Thank you very much and this will be the end of questions. I do not want to prolong this session. Uh, but I would like to sum it up, just as the former uh, chair did. In short, if we should try to sum this up, as least, at least how I understood the, the very learned uh, presentations. Uh, by you, Chris Eaton, we learned that traditional way of corruption, that is match fixing. That is the uh, traditional way of, of corruption. So it's a replica of how corruption is uh, in society as such. <coughs> it's a complex fraud. It's international criminality, and the betting fraud is the core problem, as I understood it. We learned from you, Chris Rasmussen, that the betting market is increasing by 7 to 15 percent a year, and the illegal betting market, we don't know, but is, is a, ma a massive amount of million of euros. We learned from you, Lil Van Megan, this very interesting sociological study, the Black Book, where you have interviewed th over 3,000 players about the interconnect, uh, interconnection of uh, contracts, financing, training alone, match fixing and so forth. Very interesting to learn about. I hope this black book either is published or will be in due time. And we learned from you, Drago Cross, that at least we heard about the Eastern culture of, uh, of match fixing. But I think the key no uh, words here is that the different uh, public bodies and private bodies, the sports organizations, the law enforcement and the betting organization has to work together, perhaps um, under a overarching legislation or, s or s uh, something like that. And then I heard also the legal protection of whistleblowers is something that is at stake here. And from you, uh, uh, we heard, Shin, uh, Shin, that I forgot my notes, but I remember still what is said. It is about the holistic approach to deal with this uh, problem. We cannot just uh, pinpoint at one uh, problem and say we're going to solve this problem by losing this uh, simple problem. It is a, a huge and massive problem that has to be, uh, ha we have to have a holistic approach. So this is to sum it up. I hope I didn't misunderstood any of you. We can correct it later. So I think a big round of applause to the panel and thank you very much. Please stay in the room. There are some very important things going to happen now.
thanks also from our side to the speakers for the discipline, the information value, and the, um, let's say, the, the way that they motivate us to go deeper into this issue tomorrow morning at a session starting at 9 sharp. Um, soon, we will go out to the next room for one welcome drink. And I think I have to stress one thing because I think somebody did not know that rule that when we offer a drink for dinner or lunch, it's one drink. You are welcome to add more drinks, but that will be by visiting the bar. Then you will understand why we offer one drink. Um, I'm sure you can all count to one, even with an amount of alcohol inside. The storm. Well, as agreed, the storm is settling now. So those who need to leave this hotel to go to another hotel later in the evening can do so. But still watch out for flying trampolines. Uh, it is the police has actually lifted their warnings now. It is OK to go out if you feel you need so. And now I got to show you something. This is a, a an artwork, a graphic artwork made by a man who has left a very important mark on Danish sports life. He has also left an important mark on international music because his son is called Lars Ulrich. Somebody will know him from a band called Metallica. But he has certainly a lot to offer on his own. His name is Torben Ulrich. He um, was a very, very untraditional tennis player in Denmark. Actually, in 1966, he made it as expected to the men's single finals. And he had said in advance to the organizers, the Danish Lawn Tennis Federation, that unfortunately, if the match lasted longer than one hour, he would have to go because for the first time, the World Cup finals in football were actually shown on live television. Of course, the Lawn Tennis people could not regard a sport like football not in the 60s. But it happened so that Torben Ulrich actually had a massive lead in the final, but at three o'clock in the afternoon, he put down his racket and went to see the soccer match. He got one of his many quarantines at that moment, but as you say, it was funny because very often when we had to play an important Davis Cup match, my, s my suspensions were lifted. So there were also governance challenges at that time. And uh, later in his years, uh, uh, Tom Ulrich had experimented with using rackets, skipping ropes, to produce this kind of uh, uh, graphic art. He makes this with his marinated skipping rope. He then he writes a poem. And at the end, he takes a marinated tennis ball and he shoots it up and see where it ends. That's the zen of this picture, you may say. I explain this because this is actually something, a story I used to tell at the end of the conference, but for specific reasons, I tell it today because this is the material symbol of the Play the Game Award, which we are going to hand over in a few minutes. But to keep suspense a little bit, we also use play the game just for some brief interchange, uh, like book launches. So now you will have three blitz presentations of three books, so you can identify the authors, you can uh, ask interested to, uh, to, to what the book contains. But right now I would ask first um, Declan Hill, now we have discussed match fixing, Declan, will you give your sales 
pitch, is that is what it's called? Declan will speak tomorrow about um, uh, match fixing. Uh, he knows a bit about it, actually. Um, we heard him first time speak in 2005 about this, and he has created a lot of stir since. Um, look, I, I'd, I'll be very brief. Uh, we're all pretty tired, um, and you're tired of, of talking particularly about match fixing. We'll pick this up tomorrow. Um, we're at war. Um, uh, many of the panelists um, and I disagree on how we should tackle that war, but we certainly don't disagree on we want to win this war. There are <coughs> uh, over 60 national police investigations. There are hundreds of fixed matches, and there are thousands of players who've been arrested. We're engaged in a war, and we actually don't know how the enemy is fighting. So my book, which I'm launching in two weeks at the University of Burbank in, in London on November the 11th, uh, with a special lecture and then a, and a book launch afterwards, is uh, my doctoral thesis from uh, Oxford. Uh, it's the statistics. Most of you guys know me as an investigative journalist, guy who put on hidden camera and walked into um, uh, Singapore, Bangkok, match-fixing gang and reported about that. This is not that. It's about how those guys work. It's about how they get people to uh, do what they want. Um, it's about very basic building blocks of how we're going to fight this war. I am totally open to any questions, and I hope you continue to keep fighting this war with me. Thank you. And just for the sake of practicality, is it right that the book title is an insider's guide, guide an insider's guide to match fixing? I'm sorry, I, I Just a detail. Thank you. And uh, to stay in the legal arena, can I call on Karen Jones? from the ASA Institute in the Netherlands. Hello, <laughs> I'm Karen Jones with uh, the ASA International Sports Law Center and I have worked uh, on a book, um, editing a book, with my colleague and friend Michele Colucci out of Belgium, and it's the uh, European Sports Law and Policy Bulletin, and um, it's on international and comparative sports justice. And essentially, it's looking at um, a couple dozen uh, countries, national laws, how they handle sports justice, and how and the interplay between sports justice and ordinary justice and uh, we're doing several book launches over the next few months and the book should be available um, within the next few weeks so just wanted to give you information about that i have flyers i'll also pr make sure that play the game has an electric uh, electronic version of it I in case you want to uh, to read a little bit more about the information but there are a lot of wonderful uh, contributors uh, to this book. Uh, Will Van Meegen also was one of the contributing authors. I see him standing back there. <laughs> so, so I just wanted to announce that. And if you have any questions, just let me know. Thank you. Thank you, Car thank you, Karen. Uh, in 2005, uh, Play the Game uh, launched the first international sports press survey. And we had made this fantastic discovery just, just by launching a call by email. We could immediately engage 14 research institutions uh, in 10 countries simply by offering not money, but data. So we knew, th we discovered that data was a very important currency. And uh, this um, survey had a follow up. And Jörg Uwe Nieland, who is a senior lecturer at the German Sport University Cologne, We'll just give you a few words on that. Thanks. Hello, uh, I'm Jörg Nieland, as uh, uh, Jens mentioned. Uh, I keep it very brief. Um, first of all, I have to apologize to my colleague and co-editor, uh, Thomas Hockey, who was one of the victims of the storm. 
Uh, hopefully he get, uh, makes it tomorrow. Um, I can show you the uh, book, uh, the work of an, uh, okay, for the photo. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's the International Press Survey, uh, Sports Press Survey uh, 2011. It's a comparative study on the quality of sports reporting and print media. Um, we collected uh, data, as Jens mentioned, uh, from uh, 22 countries. And in the book, we present also um, very special um, country uh, studies from 14 countries. Um, if you will hear, hear more about the study, the survey, uh, you can visit uh, on Wednesday our workshop there we will present a few more uh, um, findings in detail. Uh, but most important, the book is available uh, um, at the conference for a very special, very, very special uh, uh, conference prize of 20 euros. Thanks. This was our advertising sec section. Uh, now I'd like to invite the vice chair of the board of Play the Game in the Danish Institute for Sport, Sport Studies, a very experienced uh, sports political advisor to many Danish ministry, uh, mi ministers of culture, and uh, also an active support from a minister of culture who was particularly engaged in the uh, creation of the World Anti-Doping Agency, and uh, right now a political consultant for uh, DGI, the Danish Gym Gymnastics and Sports Associations, and uh, but he is our board member in his because of his general sports political competences and his uh, great commitment, um, named uh, also by the present Minister of Culture, actually. So I'd like to invite Søren Rieskær uh, to say a few words uh, about the Play the Game Award 2013. Thank you, Jens. The Play the Game Award has been given at every Play the Game conference since 2002 in order to strengthen the basic ethical values of sport and encourage democracy, transparency, and freedom of expression in world sport. The award pays tribute to an individual or a group of persons who in their professional careers or as volunteers in sport have made an outstanding effort to strengthen the basic ethical values of sport. The award is a, awarded by a committee consisting of members of the board uh, and the two directors of Play the Game and the previous award winners from 2011 and as you might remember, that is the two renowned investigative journalists, Jens Weinreich and Andrew Jennings. The award has previously been conferred to courageous journalists and whistleblowers who went up against the wind and challenged the leadership in big sports organizations. This time, we are looking in another direction. It is a standard argument among sport leaders that change in international sport will not happen just because journalists and whistleblowers and organizations like Play the Game make a lot of noise from the outside. Change must come from the inside, the argument sounds. And at the inside, you have to be diplomatic and discreet and very low key but it is sometimes difficult to find leaders at the inside of sport who are really committed to go to the root of the problems like failed or half-hearted anti-doping strategies, problems like poor governance in international organizations, almost inviting leaders to make personal gains or to be tempted by outright corruption or to protect their power with dictatorial management or problems like lack of consequences for abuse of positions and mismanagement by many sport leaders who have broken the rules. 
while athletes are often subject to very tough sanctions by the same leaders if they cross much thinner lines. But actually, there is at least one courageous insider who proves you can achieve a lot, even if you often is anything but discreet, diplomatic, and low-key. And we are defi definitely not talking about a Mr. Nobody in the international sports movement. It is not a person who made his way up by, hier by hierarchy by patting his peers on the back without ever expressing a controversial opinion. It is perhaps not a person you will always agree with or like to disagree with, and it might be a person who from time to time opted to choose hin his inter internal fights with care. But the person we are going to honor today with the Play, play the Game Award is a person who has added significant value to the world of sport during his many years as a top-level international sports leader. He was in fact one of the leaders that personally took tough responsibility for cleaning the house and changing some of the most outdated structures in the International Olympic Committee when the house was really burning in the late, 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 late 90s. That process did certainly not only win him friends. He was also one of the architects behind the quite successful establishment of the World Anti-Doping Agency in its first years in a climate where governments and the sports movement deeply mistrust mistrusted each other, although both parties recognized that doping abuse in sport had gone out of control. That pioneer effort didn't only win him, win him friends either. He is always available to the press and to the homeless questions which he tries to answer, and he is always open to take part in any debate. And finally, but not least, his integrity is out of question. And here I speak of personal experience. As you might have heard earlier today, this person has not abandoned his direct and critical style. He's ruthless and direct when it comes to pointing with his fingers at all the critical points in the international fight against doping. It is necessary to have these very direct but still constructive critics at the very center of the sports movement. And it is necessary that people from the inside are both willing and able to engage with the outside world. This person has always put himself at the disposal of the public debate, also in stormy waters and when the winds was not in his favor. As long as we have known him, he has been a friend and firm supporter of Play the Game and our core values. Even when he was a candidate for the IOC presidency in 2000, he decided to come to our conference for the first time. This was seen as very controversial by some members of the Olympic family, and it definitely did not help his campaign. Over ye the years, his support for Play the Game's agenda has probably not earn, earned him many additional credits in the corridors of sports power in the Olympic family, but it has earned him our respect and gratitude. So now we have arrived at the point where we cannot announce the winner, where we can announce the winner of the Play the Game Award 2013. The award committee was unanimous in its decision even the most critical souls in the group admitted willingly that our man was worthy recipient, uh, a worthy recipient of the Play the Game Award 2013, Richard W. Pound. Please come.
another storm in Denmark. Uh, I'd like to th thank you all for this honor, which is, is not one that I deserve. Um, I kind of wish it had been the first award of this nature so that you would have set the bar very low and uh, each year could say that you'd uh, improved on it. Uh, I did like your description of uh, discreet and diplomatic. Uh, I find that suits me very well and I appreciate it. And I must say that I have, uh, since the first time I came to uh, play the game conference, uh, I've watched the, the organization mature and, and evolve and, and I think it's a much better organization now. Uh, it, it still is, is convinced of the need to, to point out shortcomings and I think uh, the sport world uh, needs to hear that. Um, they don't always hear it, even if the words are uh, um, register on their eardrums, but I think it's important uh, that, that they listen. In my case, uh, I must say, uh, any, every time I come to a conference of this nature, I learn something that I didn't know before and that if taken on board in the right way can help us to uh, improve uh, what we do. Uh, I do believe that as, as many have said here that we, sport has become so important uh, that, that we in fact do face a crisis and that we should not wait until we hit the wall uh, before we do something about it. Because once you hit the wall, you have no idea what chaos uh, will result and how long it takes to, to earn back a reputation that you've built up for, uh, for many years. So keep up the good work. Uh, I, for my part, will try to encourage uh, a more responsive participation from within the IOC because I think we should be here uh, not only to speak about what we think is important, but to hear uh, what other people uh, believe is important. And the combination, I think, will make for a better, uh, better morally based, ethically based uh, sport system in the world. And we do need some guiding values these days. So thank you once again. Uh, I'm sorry you were short of, uh, of possible uh, recipients, but I'm um, happy to, to, to take home this, uh, this uh, uh, great souvenir of, of the evening, but also of uh, Danish tennis. Well, the day is over, the storm has calmed, there are drinks in the neighboring room, I need I say no more, or need I say more? No, I don't think so. Thanks for coming today, thanks for your support for the speakers, thanks for attending carefully. There's another long day tomorrow, we hope you'll find your way home safely. <laughs>